to the E4M talk show. Our guest today is Anjana Ghosh, CEO of Exotic Fridges. FMCG veteran Anjana joined this family-run business last year when the company decided to rope in a CEO to accelerate its growth. Welcome to the show, Anjana. Thank you. Anjana, you worked in Bislady for 15 long years before joining Exotic and you were in kind of, you know, comfort zone. Then how challenging or different these six months have been for you? Well, rightly put by you, I was really, uh, of course, the initial years with uh, Bislavi was, because when I joined Bislavi, it was in a similar capacity. It was a company with about say, 200 crore turnover. And when I left Bislavi after 16 years, it, we had reached almost around 2,000 crore. So that was my journey from 200 to 2,000 in, in Bislavi. And uh, yes, rightly put, at the uh, far end of my career with Bislavi, I I felt that yes, now you know that there is not much to be done, and I had got into a comfort zone, and uh, that's when I think uh, our current promoters, promoter Mr. Rajiv Segal approached me, and he said, "Now you have done enough there. Although we are a small company, but would you like to join?" And this decision for me was really, very, very you know difficult to take because I thought that I had to put in, you know, 16 years building uh, a brand with Bislavi, of course, Bislavi, our mentor was Mr. Ramesh Johan. And with him, and now again, to, you know, come back to starting a journey again and trying to work with a company which is, you know, around, say, 100, 150 crore. Uh, so that was a very difficult decision for me. But I waited for some time. I, I didn't really rule out. But uh, at the same time, I wanted to you know, sort of check out, evaluate uh, as to what, how, how would it affect my career moving ahead. So I did a bit of uh, understanding about the brand uh, because at this very, the brand was already built. And when I had to move to Exotic, uh, the brand has to be built. So that was the biggest challenge. And uh, so when I did a dipstick, I went to the to market and tried to understand how, uh, what is exotic, how exotic is, you know, currently uh, the brand Jiru, the flagship brand, how is it, you know, sort of accepted in the market. So I found two very key things uh, that came to me is that the consumers that I met, they all told, them, told me that, you know, of course, brand, it is a nice product. It's a good product, but uh, it, it, you know nowadays we don't see it, so it's not available. So my next, uh, you know, interaction was with the trade, uh, the retailers, the dependers, and they also said, "Hey, I am Madam Brad, it's a hair, like not any." So then I thought it's a good challenge to have, a good, uh, you know, problem to have that the brand is accepted, consumer wants it, the trade wants it, but somehow it is not reaching. So this then it becomes an easier task for me that the distribution has to be ramped up, the production has to be ramped up. And I said that this is something which you know, really sounds that yes, you know, I can get things together and take it up. So that's when I decided and, and in August, end of August, I told Mr. Segal, okay, yes, I'm ready to join because this is something which I will be creating from the scratch. Because the want is already there, then the journey becomes much easier. Uh, so that's how I accepted it. And post four, five months now, I'm here. So, so we would like to know how exotic is placed in the tough non-alcoholic beverage market. Well, I see this company exotic is absolutely, it's not a new uh, company. The brand is neither new. In fact, this brand had created its own niche by starting the Jira Masala in the year 2007 when the Jira Masala did not exist. So it has its own first mover advantage and uh, Jiru as a brand is well known to the consumer and the taste is well established. The consumer wants it. Uh, yes, and it is a 15-year-old company, not really new. And in the last 15 years, they have been growing well at around a gather of say 30% year on year, a profit making company, completely you know independent. Uh, the promoter family was running it. The next generation have joined about say four, five, five, six years back. Uh, Mr. Seigel was running it earlier. So the so it, so it, it is a promoter driven company, but but the values of the company as as the family is, it, it has its own niche, it has its own pull. 
So I don't think it is absolutely, you know, uh, because yes, I have worked with a promoter driven company even in this living. So the, there the promoter's values and here the promoter's values are quite similar because they are more tuned towards customers, they are internal employees. The environment in the organization is very, very conducive for people to you know, sort of work, learn, and uh, uh, achieve milestones. So as a company, yes, uh, it's, it, it's, it's on, on, on the you know, probably level of any other good organized company would be. But yes, the turnover is small because it started from zero to where it has reached now. Uh, but yeah, the value system is in place uh, and the company is well. I think, yes, we can build much better, but yes, the foundation is quite strong. Anjana, you mentioned about Jeru and we learned that you are going to rebrand it as J. So can you please, you know, uh, explain us the rationale behind uh, the, the rebranding? Oh, okay. Well, you see, when uh, after... Uh, of course, in 2007, probably Jiru was the first mover. It was the only Jira drink which existed. Prior to that, there were only one or two brands uh, locally available uh, in the south, uh, not really in the north. Not uh, the entire concept of a Jira drink was more tuned to the Shikanjis that they would drink during the summertime. In Bombay, again, the Jira drink was more as Jaljira, which was available, you know, uh, ready to drink at a restaurant or at a fast food joint. So when this bottled concept came in, and prior to that, yes, partly also had dabbled with this idea of Jira drink in Vinjan, but it never took off. So, uh, so I think what first, they have broken the barrier of that, you know, ready mix uh, drink, fresh drink to bottled drink that advantage uh, Jiru already had uh, taken up and they have given a bottled version of Jira uh, and they had the first mover advantage and they were doing good. But today when I look at the market, there is N number of Jira. There is 192 brands of Jira across India. Because this Jira somehow is a very uh, you know known kind of an ingredient with the consumer. And it is also associated, unfortunately, with a, as a digestive drink. So when I look at Jira, Jiru, or any other Jira uh, drink, it, it automatically gets slotted with uh, you know, consumption of after food. And it gets associated very closely with food. So when it gets associated with food, uh, then the consumption becomes limited. Because, you know, you will drink a jira only after food. You will drink maximum one. Then again, the consumption is more uh, aligned to the consumer who are, say, probably 35, 40 plus. The young beverage drinking consumer is completely disconnected with this, uh, this kind of uh, drink because they believe that they don't need it. Then this 192 brand across India are very locally distributed. So every brand is doing a niche market in their area. So this then so they get branded as a local brand. Uh, so so this this is the kind of you know environment in which currently Jira drinks are and Jiru is also. So if I had to sort of break these barriers, it, it has got a very firm barrier around itself. You can't just come out of this barrier with the name Jira. So it had, it had to be broken. It had to you know sort of come out of this and, and try to address the new segment of consumer. And today, the maximum beverage drinking consumer is the young consumer, the 10 to you know sort of probably 25. They are consuming the beverage in all location and and multiple times in a day or in a week. Now, if I have to address, if I have to go and offer this drink to them, then of course it cannot be Jiru because they are not associated with the brand. They just do not connect with the brand. And that's where when I thought that I, we have to come out of this whole you know, legacy of being a Jira drink because then you get slotted very much as a digestive drink and not really a fun drink. And uh, as far as the taste of Jiru is concerned, it is fantastic. So everybody loves it. Uh, probably if it even appears to, you know, the, the segment that I'm talking about, the PG that I'm talking about, they love the drink. 
But again, just because the branding is so much sort of aligned to being a local brand and Jira, it has to be only consumed with food. So they don't really enjoy it in their parties or they would not want to be seen around with a Jira. That's where the thought came in that we have to come out of this whole, you know, branding and legacy of the brand that it is a Jira drink. And that's where the rebranding and the entire exercise happened. Very interesting proposition, I guess. Mm. Uh, so right. it was it was actually a big challenge because a brand which is built on its core uh, you know proposition of being a jira good tasting jira drink to break that and come out of the jira was a real challenge and uh, you know because the, the entire perception about the brand has to be changed uh, so of course yes but then we did a bit of a research we understood the consumption patterns of the the new generation, the, the so-called Zen Z. And we understood that, yes, if we just do, you know, change the proposition because it's a good tasting uh, drink, it, it will be accepted. And yes, even internally, we had a lot of, you know, <laughs> debates and uh, discussions uh, to change a brand which has a legacy of, you know, being a good Jira brand to completely come out of the identity was really a big challenge. Very interesting. J for Z. Okay. So <laughs> what, what is the share of carbonated and non-carbonated uh, categories uh, in terms of volume or maybe revenue? And I would also like to know from you, how has consumer behavior changed, you know, in between these two categories over the years? See, the beverage category as such across India is a 60,000 crore category, which is a huge category. So if it is a 60,000 crore category, so you can understand the consumption of the brand. So maybe in the food category, the FMCG food category, beverage is the largest you know, consumption, largest consumption. And in that, uh, carbonated leads, because carbonated, again, is somehow very much associated, because it is carbonated, it is associated with celebration and fun. So when you have a party, you will never sit with a still drink, like a you know fruit juice or something. You would always want to have something which is bubbly. Bubbly means carbonated. So out of the beverage, 60,000 crore, 80% is ruled by the carbonated segment because that's the celebration part. When you have to want to have fun, when you have to have party, you will always bring in a carbonated drink your Cokes and the Pepsis and, and the Sprites. So that's how the carbonated rules the beverage consumption. Uh, and and, and the about, what about exotic? I mean, what is the, oh, the oh, oh, proportion no, in no, carbonated no. and non-commerce <laughs> categories within exotic? So, so within exotic, the carbonated category is again 80% because uh, Jira, uh, Jiru is with carbonation. And uh, that is our flagship brand. And in fact, more than 80%, it's around 85, almost close to 90% is uh, Jiru. Uh, and my other still drinks, that is the Kachan, Kala Katta, and Nibu Masala, is the other 10% on which we are working now to also take that uh, up in a big way. Because, yes, as, as you were talking about the consumer behavioral change, yes, the consumer also wants something new. Consumer is now torn between a carbonation and a still drink. Uh, carbonation still is his consumption when he is enjoying. And the still drink, that is the food juice and the other categories, are consumed when he feels that I must have something healthy. So that is even in today in the consumption pattern, 20% uh, of that carbonated is only ruled by the juices and the other variants which doesn't have carbonation. 80% is still carbonation. So the consumption, consumer behavior is changing slightly, uh, but that category is big. Consumer, the, the new consumer that we are talking about, the uh, Zen C, they have a very different attribute. They, they do not want something which is a routine. They want to sort of break, you know, every uh, status quo which probably the earlier generation had held on to. So this generation wants to challenge everything. And in challenge everything, they also want to sort of experiment with new things. So, so if you see the current trends across uh, the beverage market, you will see there is a new category of beer which is coming, which is the crafted beer. 
So now that, now that this new generation of consumers do not even like to have just the boring beer. So similarly, they are getting bored with Cokes. I mean, the, the colas and the oranges and the lemons. They want something new. They want something innovation. So, so that's the niche which is getting created uh, in the consumption demand. And that's where we want to play in. We want to get into a, a segment where we will innovate. We will have carbonation, no doubt about it. But at the same time, we will want to be something new. So the consumer that is looking out for new drinks, he would want to have a new uh, variant probably for him uh, every year. That's how we plan. Okay. Uh, you mean to say you, you might enter into beer uh, category also? No, 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 no. <laughs> no. It would I was be just giving you an example. Okay, okay. It would be interesting to know about your strategic roadmap. I mean, for which I, the company, roped in. Oh, well, see, the company currently is at around, as I said, 150 crore. Uh, we want to become a 1,000 crore company in the next five years. Because that's the need of the art today. If you have to survive in a very competitive environment uh, that's emerging now, you have to be a big player. You cannot remain a small player. So that's the need, and that's where we are moving, that we want to be a uh, house floor in the next five years. So that's the strategy that we have put for ourselves, for which we have inducted people, because people are the base of any organization. So people have all come in, and now how do I expand the distribution, expansion of so probably manufacturing units, et cetera, et cetera. I would like to know your media mix also, media strategy, are you going to change it? <laughs> What is the mix? I mean, what is the share of digital and TV spend? See, I mean, currently, if you ask me uh, very frankly, I have not even thought about that because I strongly believe that for a brand, the distribution has to be in place and uh, you have to be available everywhere and that's where you can start your communication strategy because if your consumer has to connect with your brand, the brand should be available. So if you ask me truly, my first year plan is only to increase distribution. And in this year, we will only concentrate mostly on uh, digital because that's the medium where I can build in uh, the initial engagement with my consumers and maybe the below the line that is at the point of sale, visibilities, et cetera, but not really a very big medium. Mix. Okay, and then now last question. Uh, uh, women professionals, they often have to push through many barriers to, to, to build alliances, to influence, to, to convince others. What was your experience when you started off your career and do you see any changes in the boardroom discussion now? Yes, I always uh, get this question. Uh, but you know, fortunately for me, throughout my journey, I, I am now in the industry almost for about 35 years out of which 15, 16 years has been FMCG. Prior to that 15 years, I was working quite for putting up, uh, you know, I was in project teams of putting up steel plants. And if you and if you see the steel, it, it is a very dominantly male dominated kind of an industry where females have no, no sort of entry at all. But in that fully male dominated zone too, I was a lady who was managing projects and putting up steel plants and I never thought that I had any kind of, a, you know, sort of, uh, I was deprived of anything that the men enjoyed in the industry. In fact, I was taken care of because I was used to be in a projecting only girl and the rest were all men. So I feel that a lot depends on you as a person as to how you conduct yourself, how you build in your own strength, and uh, so if you allow to be pitted, then you get pitted. Otherwise, if you don't allow that people should have sympathize with you, if you stand, if you have your own standing, and if you contribute equally as, as the men do, I don't think that there are any kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, shades that you don't get the right opportunity. And I've always had opportunity and I've always worked in an environment which was always dominated by men. And, Female were always a minority, <laughs> but uh, I think I got all my opportunities and I was appreciated throughout my career. Thank you so much for taking time out and speaking with Ephraim. Thank you. Thank much. you so much. And all the best. Thank you so much.